I do think the Keynote 024 is a, a trial result or a major step forward. And we, we are, you know, in my practice, I think it's going to be 10 to 20 percent are going to get Pembro in the first line setting based on that mm -hmm. trial. Uh, what do you do after Pembro in those patients? Tracy? Yeah, I'll go back to the standard chemotherapy. I haven't had somebody who I've put on it yeah. who's progressed on it yet, yeah. but my plan would be to go back to my standard first-line chemotherapy options. Should we get rid of first-line, second-line, third-line, well, just use next-line? <laughs> right, right. And, and actually, it's interesting because there was a lot of angst in some of the pharmaceutical companies would they because their drug is approved based on line of therapy. But the way yeah. I think about it is... The only place that line of therapy applies, I think, is cytotoxic therapy. There's right. first line cytotoxic and second line cytotoxic. Yeah. So if they've had first line immunotherapy yeah. and they've progressed, then they're going on to first line cytotoxic therapy, and I'll use all the usual first line cytotoxics that I used. Okay. Others? Same same thinking? Yeah. And, and maybe we should just eliminate the first line yeah. altogether, combination cytotoxic chemotherapy, because we anticipate that it's going to be tolerated in this in this setting after immunotherapy versus single agent chemotherapy in later lines after progression on second line or third line immunotherapy. So in, in these patients or those the, the, the greater mass that is not strongly PDL1 positive mm -hmm. where and they don't have an oncogenic driver and let's say you've searched high and low for any actionable sort of thing, you don't have anything, we're still kind of in the um, chemotherapy cytotoxic uh, um, uh, arena. Outside of a clinical trial, outside. yes. It's important to remember that chemotherapy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Outside of a clinical trial. And can be very effective. Yes. That's the other thing that's important to so, remember. So, Tracy, what are your go to regimens in, that, in this population? So, right, we're talking about non squamous. Non then, yes. Then, yeah. then carboplatin and pemetrexid is my go to regimen, plus or minus bevacizumab, depending upon the individual characteristics of the patient. And Alex, same thing. Same. Platinum pemetrexid plus minus bev. Okay. And and what on uh, um, Valley? Same thing. Same thing. What percentage of patients would you say in your practice do you make the decision to use bevacizumab? Twenty or thirty percent. Maybe a little less. Probably forty percent. Okay. All right. I'm probably more in the forty percent range. Mm -hmm. uh, also. We really have a lack of data in the context of pemetrexid and carboplatin to what we add. Um, if we add or if you add. That, that, exactly, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm yeah. getting at. Yeah, what, yeah. what will we add, if anything, with bevacizumab in that context? Right. We know for sure that with carboplatin and paclitaxel that the addition of bevacizumab does, uh, does help. Uh, but with the, the tolerability of, of PEM, um, as well as some of the um, histology-specific data, I think many in both academia and community have moved towards it uh, in the front line, and now we just don't know what, what we get. It, you know, it's something that I have a difficult um, time understanding because I like to, you know, base my judgment on evidence. And I'm just not quite sure where the evidence is that in a non-squamous BEV-eligible population, mm -hmm. that that giving carbopem alone is as good as the three-drug combination of carbo. PEM or paclitaxel with BEV. We just don't have that data um, yeah. to, to say that, it, that you aren't compromising outcomes. We know from a BEV point of view that for better or for worse, there, it, it's an agent that has four positive phase three trials. Yep. Mm -hmm. It met every endpoint in four phase three mm -hmm. trials, right? Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you use it? There are lots of reasons not to use it, mm -hmm. but uh, now, okay, I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> well, so, so, then, so then the question becomes, if you are using carbopembev, what does everybody do in maintenance, where I think it becomes yeah. even muddier? It does. Um, and talk about really racking up the cost on, on providing care. If you have people who are on long-term maintenance, pemetrexid and bevacizumab, that really breaks the bank. What about use of anti-angiogenic agents beyond first line, second line? We know the docetaxel... Ramucirumab Revel data is that is that part of your standard? Let's say for some reason the patient can't get immunotherapy, is that your standard second line? It's not. I don't like using docetaxel all that much at um, f at full Q3 week dosing, and I think the benefit of ramucirumab with some additional toxicity, um, it's not worth the expensive cost. It's ten thousand dollars a month that you're adding, and the hazard ratio was I think 0.84 for overall survival. So yes, there's an overall survival benefit, but it was quite small and it did add additional toxicity and it adds a heck load of expense and it makes me feel like I need to give docetaxel 
in a way that I think is quite toxic. So I have not adopted that. Others have different feelings? No, very similar. Um, I, I think that that was a well-run, randomized phase three trial that showed an advantage for the addition of ramucirumab to docetaxel. The problem is, is that I share Tracy's bias against using docetaxel. Patients feel awful on it. So if I do have reason to pull out docetaxel in my practice, I tend to dose reduce it. There's some Chinese data that you can go down to 60 without mm -hmm. impairing efficacy in the second line. And if I do that, I'll, I'll add ramucirumab to it. But my lack of use is primarily driven uh, by a distaste for docetaxel. So now there is, uh, there is data looking at the combination of taxol and bevacizumab in the second line that we uh, just got uh, a look at. Um, that was favorable compared to docetaxel. Um, but it was not a very user-friendly uh, regimen. It was um, a weekly regimen, weekly, if I recall. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure that it's gotten a lot of real-world uh, uptake, but it's certainly a valid option. In, 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 in a second-line trial, right, the, the French trial, and so it brings up the issue is that even though we know these two antibodies, bevacizumab and ramucirumab, have different mechanisms of action, is there a biologic impact any different? I mean, the data kind of looks similar. Um, it's hard set. to say. It is hard to say, yeah. Well, this has been extremely informative. Before we end this discussion, I'd like to get some final thoughts from each of our panelists. Uh, Dr. Drillin? Sure. So as we've discussed, there have been exciting developments both in the targeted therapy arena and in the IO arena. And I think my major point is to try to get as much tissue as is safe and feasible in order to test your patients for both biomarkers. Tracy? Yes, there's a lot of reason for hope in the treatment of advanced non-small cell lung cancer, but there's still those patients for whom none of this new stuff is going to work, and we have to keep them in our hearts. And remember that early palliative care has also been shown to be very beneficial in this patient population. Right, good, good point. Jared? You can't action a molecular altercation if you uh, haven't tested for and found it, so test every patient. Um, and the same goes for uh, immunotherapy in the first line. You can't offer this to patients if you haven't tested for it. In Valley? I think there have been dramatic changes in the landscape uh, of treatment of non-small cell, and I think that's testament to the efforts of academic community, pharmaceutical companies, and the FDA. And I think the intense focus for the next uh, few years is going to be combinations of immunotherapy with other agents and how to best fit them in the treatment of all of the patients, not just a minority. Yeah, no, I think you raise a good point. The academic community, uh, the pharmaceutical community, the NCI, even community physicians have a vital part in advancing the, 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 the bar, if you will. We all have to be in this together, and it really underscores the importance of uh, clinical trials, ones that are well designed and ones that we try to do as quickly as we can so we get the answers and, and, and move on. So thank you all uh, for your contributions to this discussion. On behalf of our panel, we thank you for joining us. And we hope you found this peer exchange discussion to be useful and informative.